Sorry, everyone. This got connected and disconnected a bunch of times. It seems like now. So give me just one. Let me start this. I promise that it was working for. Um, but. So I am the project lead on HashCorp's Vault. It's a tool for managing secrets. And previously, I was an architect at Akamai. Um, I had a heavy focus on containerization and managing uh, container security. Okay. Good. Okay, so another point. So what this talk is, so I'm gonna talk about um, paradigms and uh, and considerations necessary for managing secrets. So the initial version of this talk, which was a lot more like the abstract, was really more of like a listing of different things you can do, management strategies and pros and cons. And I ran it by some coworkers who don't have a security background. They basically said, okay, I get what you're saying here, but I don't understand why I should care. Like, what are we trying to protect from who and how? And the feedback I got was, don't give me advice to blindly follow, let me know what's going on. So, um, so I'm gonna talk about paradigms and considerations more than specific uh, answers, but I'm gonna hope to stay firmly in the realm of applied security and not get to things like crypto security. So, when you're talking about a security policy for your containers and what you have to do to protect secrets and manage them, then I want to help give you information about what you need to know, know what you need to know. Um, so this talk isn't a one true answer. And the problem is that there isn't any one true answer because there's no such thing as a homogenous environment. Um, anything I say that, you know, that works within the context of, say, uh, you know, Mesos isn't necessarily going to work in the context of Kubernetes or in the context of Fleet or something. Um, you know, different people have different degrees to which they are 100% on containers. A lot of people are partly containers, partly you know, uh, other managed systems, you know, EC2, for instance. Um, so it's not, there isn't any such thing as you know, just a one true answer for solving security uh, and secret management. Um, and every organization in the end has to set their own security policy. And we'll talk about what that means and what we need to think about. Um, I'm also not going to get into container hypervisor OS security. And I want to talk about you know, what capabilities should you be setting in your Docker containers, um, things like that. We're just going to stay at like the Linux containerization level. We're not going to talk about, OK, how does OS X or Solar Zen stick? OK, it's also not a super deep dive into security rules. Um, three to four turtles max. So you've probably all heard the, the phrase turtles all the way down. In security, usually that means increasing levels of paranoia. Um, so we're going to stay like somewhere around like, three or four choices. We're not going to go too far. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this picture a lot, but I'm going to talk about the entities that we're going to be looking at in terms of like the problem space for this talk. So we have a schedule, um, and we'll talk about what the scheduler is doing here and why it's important. But we have a scheduler, we have a scheduler agent. That agent is usually running on a clock. So in a common setup, you'll probably have, let's say, EC2 instances. And You'll have some boxes that are running your scheduling system, and you'll have some others that are running Docker that have a, schedule, a scheduling agent on them. Um, there's also a secret management tool, which I'll get to in a bit. It's great out for the moment. I'll just keep it out of this problem space uh, for now. And a container that isn't yet started, but we want to start this container. We want to get secrets to it. Um, OK, so for about four slides, I promise it's only four slides, I'm going to wax a little philosophical. But the, the thing is, we need to make sure we're all on the same page about like what these terms are. When I say a secret, when I say security, what am I talking about? Um, so I'm going to define these terms for the context of this talk. So security is a practice of risk management, right? Accepting some risks, um, guarding against violation of norms. What's a norm? It's something like a stranger should not have access to your database, right? That's a norm. Um, someone shouldn't be able to spoof your identity. That's a that's a norm. You want to and this is a common definition of security within organizations, um, but it's even applicable, applicable in other contexts. Like personal security, you're probably managing your life and life, right? You know, uh, risk. To, you know, you're managing risk to yourself. If you are doing something that has a lot of risk in it, then you know your personal security is being uh, constrained. Um, and this this is a definition that is used in a lot of big organizations. So when I was at Akamai, the info security department owned the incident management process, and that's because risk was considered in a wheelhouse of info security. Um, anything that causes like revenue loss, say, like an incident that causes revenue loss, is causing harm to the organization. So you need to talk about it in a security context. Um, so anything that elevates risk is a threat. 
Um, and when you are talking about security policy, you basically need to think about what, where are the places where, oh, where risk is elevated. You don't have to monitor. And this is kind of a, this doesn't fit into the larger context, but risk increases with system complexity. It's kind of a, a no-brainer. And for the more, the more complex something is, the more confusing it is, the more points of failure, um, the harder it is to secure. Okay, so a secret is something that will elevate your risk if exposed, um, unauthorized entities. So this can come in many forms. Um, uh, oh, sorry, these undesired consequences are harms which can come in many forms. So things like identity spoofing, private data egress, um, can even be things like regulatory fines or embarrassment to your organization that later on can mean that you lose customers and revenue because they don't want to be associated with you. Um, so an exposed secret that gets out into the wild is a threat. Right? Something that is, you know, a threat if it's exposed is something that you want to keep secret. And not all things that can be disclosed are secrets. Some are identifiers. So in a username and password context, the username is usually not secret. It's an identifier. That doesn't mean that there isn't a little bit of elevated risk if it gets out, but it just means that we've chosen to accept that risk, right? What we really want to control is that second part of that, that two-factor mechanism. Um, okay. This is the last philosophical slide I promise. What is trust? So a trusted entity is one that will not divulge a secret it has access to. In modeling trusted entities, it's companion to modeling threats, right? So you can, if you're modeling threats, you can say, all right, I want to figure out who can I trust, and those are the places where I can have, let's say, long-term storage of secrets. So there's two concepts, circle of trust, chain of trust. Um, Circle of trust, entities that we trust with any secret. So these are things like your CPU. Now, can someone come onto your machine, and can they do all these clever, crazy things with like, you know, spoofing cache lines, like making things, you know, get disclosed through really super clever tricks with lots of assembly code, absolutely. But in terms of like applied security, we're just gonna make sure that, that you know, we're, we're kinda gonna hand with that away. We're gonna say, look, we can trust our CPU. We can trust something that's stored in RAM. Um, we can trust the secret management tool. We can trust root. If we can't trust root, we have big people to, to trust employees. Right? Some employees maybe we trust more than others. So some employees might be part of our circle of trust, but not, often they aren't. Um, and finally, the cloud. Right? We may or may not trust a cloud provider. We may or may not trust the employees of the cloud provider. Um, but sometimes they can be in our circle of trust. That can be part of our policy. Um, so, Who's outside, things like persistent storage. Usually, you don't want to commit a secret device. It's going to get out. Um, a random Wi-Fi hotspot that doesn't have you know, uh, a WPA2. Um, the NSA, probably outside of our circle of trust. Um, your mom's notepad.txt, which is stores your bank passwords, is, should be way outside our circle of trust. <laughs> so we're talking about things where we, where we can have long-term storage of secrets. So the chain of trust is the set of links, or like say network hops, that any particular secret travels through from point A to point B, where point A and point B are in the circle of trust. So let's say from secret management system to memory of a container, right? So in order to get from point A to point B, both entities we want to have in our circle of trust, but we need to get it through the chain of trust. So any link is a, is a place where that can be intercepted. Um, or access. So, what are the ways that can, they can be accessed? So, it could be accidental logging. You know, um, it's an environment variable that gets logged to some debug log somewhere. Some of these things are Exploitation by attacker, look by operator. Um, someone writes something down on a post it. Um, or a compromised employee that you know, has gambling debts and is trying to do something to, uh, to get rid of those. Okay, so now we can establish the problem space, right? So the, we want to manage secrets in environment, but that means managing the, or, and establishing the trust chains in that environment. Um, and every link in that, train, in that chain has associated risks. We want to minimize the hops and minimize the risk per link. Um, we cannot fully mitigate risk. Risk can never go away. There's always going to be risk. Um, and so you basically have to assume that over a long enough period of time, any secret will be diverged. If it ever leaves the circle of trust, ever, it's going to get divulged. And it may even be divulged from the circle of trust if it's around long enough. Um, and the ultimate goal is zero trust. Don't trust anyone. And that's different from paranoia, where you kind of are assuming everywhere that you look, you kind of delve deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Okay, well, we think this is good, but what about this? What about this? This is about don't give the opportunity for risks to occur in the first place, right? 
just start start off with a baseline level of minimize risk. Work up from there. Okay, so our goal: we want to securely move a secret from an originator to the new containers ramp. So, you know, what does that look like? Is it coming from a scheduler through an agent to a container? It's coming from a secret management tool through a scheduling agent. This is the problem, right? Secret live. How do we get it? That's the real kind of problem of secret management in containers and really anything else. It's not, this is not specific to containers, but containers have added complexity. And in some ways, they also make things easier, which we'll see. Um, OK. So establishing a train, chain of trust requires to find the requirements that, um, that we need to keep secrets protected. The good news is we only need to do this for one secret. Um, the first secret can authenticate others, right? So maybe you only ever need to get one secret to the box. Maybe it's a database password. But chances are you're actually going to have an application, and maybe you want to get a TLS certificate to the box, and you want to get a database password, and you want to get S3 credentials, right? So if, you, if your first secret can authenticate everything else that, that is requested, then you're golden. You protect that one secret, and then from there on, you have this established kind of shared secret you can use to directly access um, further secrets. So this concept is secure introduction. The secure introduction problem is getting an initial secret to an entity such that it can use that secret to get all of the other things it needs. OK, so how do you perform SI? So first, establish your success criteria. Right? So for this talk, here's my success criteria. I don't want them to live forever. And I'm going to go through like what, what these mean and why they're important. I don't want them to live forever. Secrets should not live forever. I want to distribute them securely. I want to limit the exposure if disclosed. So if we assume that there will, there will always be exposure of secrets, that they will always be disclosed in some way, shape, or form, then I want to make sure that, that, that um, the risk is minimized. I want to make sure that the amount of harm that that can do is minimized. Um, have a break glass procedure. Break glass. So does everyone know what that is? OK. So when there's a fire, then there's going to be you know, most commercial buildings, right? And that glass protects it from falling out or just being accessed by kids. Um, but in an emergency, you break that glass and pull out the fire extinguisher and you can use it. So we want to break glass procedure where we can say, OK, something's been compromised. We want to actually have something that we can do about it. And finally, we want to detect unauthorized access. This is really important. I'll get, it, I'll get to that in a moment. OK. So going through that list, so rotation. As lifetime increases, the chance for exposure goes to infinity. The longer something is around, the more chance it will have to leak accidentally or not. Um, it may be in caches or logs. It may be cracked through some attacker, you know, collecting enough packets on the network. Um, it may just be someone debugging that gets access to some, you know, something out of memory that they really shouldn't have. Um, so secrets should be rotated frequently, frequently in quotes. Um, and what that rotation depends on kind of depends on whether it's, say, user secrets or machine secrets. Going from the bottom up, machines, it's plain data, right? You plan and build for rotation, you rotate off. That's pretty easy to do because it's all just, AP, let's say, API things. Um, user passwords, you know, there's this very famous XKCD. Does anyone know what those four words are? Shout it out if you do. Yes, I didn't even need to, you know, you just knew that offhand. Um, so that really famous XKCD showed that bad policies and frequent rotation means users are going to write down passwords, right? And the less frequently that something's required to rotate, and the more, the, like, the better the policy, um, then the, the less likely someone is to actually, you know, to accidentally divulge that by just moving around. But also, the flip side of that is that, um, is that the longer a secret is around, the more likely someone will, say, oversee someone typing into a computer keyboard. Or they'll share it with someone one time, and then forget, and they won't rotate that, and suddenly that person has that password for, uh, for a term. So, that's rotating. Distribution. So this is actually moving those secrets around to and from people machines. At a base level, you want them to never be plain text, always covered, meaning encrypted or wrapped in some way, shape, or form. Limit exposure. So principle of least privilege. Um, this is what I was mentioning before. Like if, if someone gets access to database credentials, make sure they only have access to specific tables, specific operations. If they have logging credentials to a machine, let's say a private SSH key, not root, right? Use sudo. Um, API credentials, they should have a minimal feature set. You know, if you're using something like JWT um, or OAuth scopes, you can limit what someone has access to. 
um, access detection. So things have a way of being leaky. Uh, so NVARs are a really common way that people pass in C logs. And this is explicitly encouraged. If you look at, you know, so let's say a Postgres database uh, container on the Docker Hub, um, usually they'll say, okay, pass in your password in an NVAR. And there are ways around that, but that's kind of the encouraged workflow at least in development. The problem is this often translates into production. And um, environment variables are often logged, um, sometimes multiple places. Sometimes they'll say, I want to have the state of all my containers logged to my, um, to my log so that if something goes wrong, I can see what, was, what did that container look like. Um, so it's often logged, sometimes multiple places. It's easily discoverable by an author, Docker inspect, right? Um, or non-Docker tools, or non-Docker tools can say, given a process, show me the environment variables. So, you know, you want to know, like, that's an easy way for things to actually get seen, is just plopping in the plain text and variable. Um, so equally as important as protecting a secret is knowing that an unintended party has access to it and has seen it. So auto logs are really great, but do you look at your auto logs? Who like regularly scans your auto logs? Anyway. One person, great. I applaud you. <laughs> I really do. Um, but most people don't. Um, most people only look at auto logs when they know something bad has gone on. Um, so active detection, when possible, is even better. Um, break glass. So you have found out your, that something has been compromised, it has been divulged, it has been seen. Um, so what is your procedure? So you may stop all further access to protected resources, you know, cut off access to those APIs, perform forensics, figure out who had access when, where, when did they get it, what did they access during that time. Um, rotate all secrets out after reestablishing trust. Right? But you need to figure this out during the planning process and not after. You will never go back and, and come up with a good break glass procedure. It will never be important enough because there's always going to be new things coming up. So this needs to be figured out during the planning stage, like all of these other principles. Okay. So this is really complicated, all of this. It's really complicated. But there's good news. The good news is that there's been an explosion of open source secret management tools. These are tools that are designed specifically for helping you manage secrets. Vault, which I work on, um, KeyWiz, put out by Square, Knox put out by who, um, Conjure, which I, I just point out that it's Docker only. I don't know if it works with other, with like Rocket or other continue runtimes. Um, but I point that out because most secret management tools are fairly agnostic whether you're running the container or not. Um, and there are many more. Um, some of them are very small in scope. Some of them are dedicated, to, let's say, to AWS secrets. Um, some of them have other kind of smaller areas. But the point is, there are a lot of these. Um, and if I miss your favorite, I apologize. Um, and if you only take away two things from this talk, make sure they are the following. One, write your own crypto. <laughs> two, use it as a secret management tool. <laughs> no, don't ever do either of those things. Ever, ever, ever. <laughs> never do it. Okay, here's what you should take away. Use a secret management tool and don't blow your own. All right? It's harder than you think. Um, getting, you know, figuring out a good secret management tool from the ground up requires thinking a lot about all of these principles and having good stories around them. It is very hard. Don't roll your own. Just like you don't roll your own crypto. Okay. Why use them in the first place? Um, okay. Central secure storage. Um, this helps avoid secret sprawl, which is secrets everywhere with different access controls, coverage, lifetimes, um, people that, that are privy to them. Um, when you have a lot of secret sprawl, they're easy to forget, misplace, be accidentally discovered. Um, central management. Needed, you know, Pretty easy to, to figure out. Like this is a good thing. Codified secure access mechanisms. Um, so you know things like I'm going to enforce that all access takes place using TLS 1.2, right? I'm not going to allow TLS 1.0. I'm not going to allow SSL v3. If you have one place you're using for uh, to manage your secrets, you can make sure that access to that is as secure as, pos as possible. <clears throat> Centralized audit. So ensure knowledge of what secrets have been uh, seen by what users and services. So you see the word central a lot here? This isn't necessarily a bad thing, okay? So if you think about a bank where you store money, right? People come together and they put their money in banks because a bank specializes in securing that money, right? You know, uh, it's a much more secure location than mattresses and coffee jars all over different people's homes, right? So central doesn't necessarily mean bad. There's no real reason for you to distribute this because there are tools that exist that are dedicated to this problem. Okay. And finally, secret rotation, revocation, expiration. Um, and 
we're going to talk about more about uh, what that looks like. So I have to announce a caveat here. Um, this is not a vendor talk. I think I have used the word vault twice, once when introduced to myself and once in that previous list. Um, but I have a bias, right? Uh, I can't not have a bias. I work on a secret management tool, so I have a bias both for them and for the one I work on. Um, I don't have an exhaustive, exhaustive knowledge of non vault secret management tools, um, and I don't want to misrepresent other secret management tools in any way, shape, or form. So anything I say a secret management tool uh, can do can be done with vault, um, but may or may not be possible with other solutions. And this is fully admitting that other secret management tools do things that vault can't. So I just want to make that very, very clear. I'm talking about capabilities of secret management tools, and these are things that exist in software that you know I know that they exist in at least one piece of software, but I can't speak other secret management tools. Um, so I just want to make, make it you know, clear. I don't want to misrepresent any other ones. Uh, this is not a vendor talk. Um, OK. So secret management tools and secure introduction. Remember, secure introduction is getting that first initial secret to your container so that it can then fetch other secrets from your secret management uh, system. Um, secret management tools have an explicit focus on the secure introduction problem. This is core to what they do. Um, and this is a really th important reason why you should be looking at them and integrating them into your work. Because secure introduction is really, really hard. Um, and it's not that secret management tools make that go away. It's that they have the security primitives that are necessary to help make this more secure. Um, and putting together these security primitives is very difficult to do, uh, to do yourself. So you know, containers can support existing SI programs. So you know, let's say you're a user and you have a password that you know, um, and you log on with LDAP, right? So you, know, you could give an LDAP password to a container, and it could then you know, fetch some kind of secret from there. But if you, you, know, if you manage to securely do that, you've solved a secure introduction of right? Like you don't need this stuff. Like that's, but that's hard to do. Right. That's the whole point. Um, and do you really want to manage 100,000 LDAP and Active Directory individual <coughs> users? You probably don't want to. It's going to be bad news. Um, or let's say that you're using Kerberos because um, you're uh, very MIT oriented or something, and you want to drop 100,000 key tabs, generate and drop them. You know, first of all, how do you actually secure getting those key tabs to those containers um, without anyone else seeing them? And second of all, um, do you really want to go through that generation? Um, Okay, so yeah, so it's not the secure management solution. Uh, secret management solutions make this problem go away, um, but you're no worse off, and you're probably much better because they are focused on this problem. Um, oops. Ah, skip that aside. Okay. Another nice thing is that most most secret management solutions. There are some that are very specific to individual platforms. So, for instance, Kubernetes has its own secret management system built in. Um, AWS, uh, there are a couple that are dedicated towards AWS um, and its APIs and its capabilities for secret storage, uh, like, uh, like Canvas. Um, but most, most of the time, they're platform agnostic um, with platform-based enhancement. So what does that mean? So the idea there is you can change the authentication mechanism that's used by any particular entities within your, your system, within your larger infrastructure, your EC2 boxes, your containers, your users, right? You may want your users to be able to get database credentials, just like you have your, um, I'm going to allow you to authenticate with me in various ways, but then everything else can happen the same way within your applications or by your users. Um, so the platform-based enhancements, so you know, a secure introduction, uh, security, a secret management solution may allow a, say, EC2-specific method of secure introduction using um, instance method, right? That might be something that's baked in. That's what I mean by platform-based enhancements. Um, so you know that might be one method, but then once you do that, then you have your your uh, uh, you have all these other benefits that you get from the secret management solution. You have the centralized management, you have the centralized audit and the access control, and so on. Um, so here's the nice thing about secret management solutions: is that uh, anyone working with containers at scale uses a schedule, right? You're using Nomad, Nessus, Fleet, Swarm, Kubernetes, right? Um, and schedulers are sources of truth, and they provide usually provide lifecycle hooks. So they want, you know, you can hook into a framework in message, so you can hook into uh, uh, various other things specific to each each uh, schedule. Um, combining the two together can be a really really nice combination. Um, so you may not have direct integration 
at this point in time. Um, I know that a lot of schedulers are giving support for various secret management solutions because they're getting a lot of comments. Um, and there may not be direct integration now, so you might need to write some glue code. Um, and usually it's not too bad writing this, this kind of code. Um, but on the other hand, then if you avoid tight coupling, right, between your scheduler and your secret management solution, then you can better reuse across environments. So if you integrate with your your uh, scheduler in you know in, in your uh, container environment, then um, uh, then you know then that's sorry for a second. If you integrate with your scheduler in your container environment, you can still reuse the same secret management solution in your other environments, right? So you write that little bit of glue code, you hook it in, and you still have that capability elsewhere. Um, uh, that's why I point out Kubernetes as an all-in-one. So because Kubernetes is very kind of um, uh, self-encompassing and trying to provide everything that you need to be an entire platform, that can make it harder times to integrate with other tools. Um, so if you are 100% totally container-focused, Kubernetes can make a lot of sense. If you have a very uh, heterogeneous environment, then that can be hard. Okay, so we come back to this uh, to this slide from before. So we have a scheduler, a scheduler agent, See, and now a secret management tool. And I'm going to work through a workflow um, that is something that's entirely possible to do today. Um, and then at the end, we'll kind of analyze how did we do, how did we hit those points on the checklist. Okay, and I'm going to be hand waving about one thing here. So I'm not going to talk about secure introduction to the schedule and the schedule and the scheduler agent. I'm just going to talk about containers. So partly that's time reasons. So I have 20 minutes left. I don't have time for questions and so on. I have much more slides. Um, and part of that is because the scheduler and scheduler agent are likely going to be running more on like a bare metal or VM and then managing Docker containers on them. If you're using something like ECS, um, then you have a very, uh, you have a very kind of container focused way of dealing with everything in the first place, like it is your scheduler. Um, but most of those other agents you're going to be using, um, uh, you know, like a cloud sort of instance and then on top of that, you have containers, usually. So, um, I'm going to hand wave away secure introduction here because I'm going to make it plain that the secret management tool is going to enable secure introduction for your bare metal. We're going to focus on a container. Um, but as we'll see, this is something that can be reused to uh, other types of systems. Um, so I, I mentioned before, just as an example, I mentioned before um, that you know you may have a mechanism that uses EC2 instance metadata to authenticate, right? So that particular host will have access to that instance metadata. It can use the trust on first use principle to provide it to a secret management solution. And if it's the first one that, that gets it in there, it starts up, then it can say, okay, I'm going to verify you with the, with the EC2 API, and I'm going to authenticate you and give you a token. Um, so I'm going to hand wave the rest of that. Um, so we're going to get to this point where I say, okay, I've given the scheduler agent a token, um, an authentication token to the secret management tool. And I'll get into the uses and TTL and policy in just a moment. And now I'm going to break it apart, th this, this chain of trust, into the second part. So this is the new part, right? It is between the container, the scheduler agent that can already talk to a secret management system, and the secret management tool. And this is where we want to get a secret from the secret management tool and establish a chain of trust flowing from there to the scheduler agent to the container. OK, so I'm going to say a number of preconditions, right? So let's say that it's a, a secret management authentication token has the following primitives. These are security primitives, right? You find them all over the place in different, um, in different systems, uh, in different uh, 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 products. You know, audit logging is very common in all sorts of things, right? Um, you find them in different parts of uh, crypto. You find them all over the place. Um, so these are not new. These are very kind of primitive security uh, aspects. And I'm going, to, I'm going to have a supposition that if you have an authentication token that has these things, um, then we can allow excellent secure introduction of containers, getting that first secret, so that you can then access other secrets using a unified API access mechanism and so on. Um, so unlimited or limited user use case. So I give you a token, and I say you can use it one time, or you can use it five times, or you can use it as many times as you want. A limited time to live. So that secret, you know, that token doesn't last forever. Um, you know, just like a, a cookie, you log in somewhere and it says, remember me for 30 days, right? That's a time to live. Um, so, uh, set of options, and you know, unlimited, unlimited, unlimited use count. That's like, okay, in those thirty days, you can log in as many times as you want. Or let's say you reset your password, you get emailed a link, and you click on that, 
right? That's a one-time use letter, right? You reset your password, you're done. That link is invalid. So that's what I'm saying. These are not things that are that are uncommon. I'm just uh, ascribing them to these authentication tokens. A set of authorization policies. So um, describing what you can do, right? So I have a token that lets me do the following, X, Y, and Z. Um, this is basic authorization, right? That's what authorization is. Um, a consistent ID to auto logs, and this is also pretty basic. If I have an auto log, I should be able to follow the actions of a particular user or token holder through, right? So consistent ID and auto logs. Um, and then this is, this is something that's a little unique. So token scoped secure storage. What this means is I want to be able to say, if for my token, I want to put a value into the secret management store. And I want only my token to be able to access this. Okay. So anyone else with another token, they can, they can perform the same operation, but they can't get access to it. And this is also not, you know, this is similar to a database, right? You have um, different users, they have different tables. Right? They can both write to a table, they can both insert rows, but they can't see each other's rows if they don't have correct authorization. Um, so token scope, secure storage, that's what that means. Okay, so let's walk through a workflow here. So you have your secret management tool. Uh, sorry, we're actually starting the schedule. Yeah. Um, okay, so the scheduler scheduling allocation is requested. The scheduler forwards a request to an agent to satisfy this. So someone says, "I want to run, um, I want to run my DB write application," and the scheduler says, "Okay, I'm going to place it on this agent over here on this container." Um, and the security policy that should get attached for DB writer, I look at, you know, it looks it up. It says, "Okay, part of this job spec is attaching the." Uh, app DB read write policy. This is just an A, right? Um, and that goes to the scheduler agent. The scheduler agent says, all right, I'm going to ask for a token. I have a policy called create app tokens, pretty descriptive. And I'm going to go to secret management tool with my token. I'm already authenticated, I'm already authorized. And I'm going to go there and say, I would like a token and with this policy. And the secret management tool does something. Five minutes? Yeah. Oh, ten minutes. <laughs> we also got off to a little bit of a late start, so hopefully okay. we'll go in the room too fast. Um, so the uh, secret management tool does, does something. So it first creates the token that we want to get to the container. This is, uh, this is this inner token here that has unlimited uses, has a one hour time to live, but is renewable. So as long as you're using it, you can go and say, please let me keep using it for another hour. Um, and has the appropriate authorization policy that we want. Um, and it puts that in the, in the scoped storage of another token that has one use, has a 30 second lifetime, that's not renewable, has no access control policies other than accessing its own secure storage, and that's it. The scheduler agent then starts up a container with the image is dbwriter, that's right after we were lost, the dbwriter image. Um, and it gives a token, passes in a token through an environment for it says, yeah, that, that is the idea of, of what we were given back from the secret management system. Now, container starts up. Um, and you know, your application may do this, or you could put a minimal application in your startup script, you know, a couple lines of shell code that do this, this switcher. Um, this is a really easy kind of thing to do. But the point is, don't be afraid of having more than one thing run, right? You don't necessarily have to start Postgres. You can start a shell script that first does this and then launches the Postgres, right? Like it's okay. So the, the container goes and goes to the secret management tool and says, "I would like to unwrap this, please." You know, I have the, I have this covered token. I have this outer token. It's covering this inner. It's wrapping. It. I would like to unwrap it. And the secret management tool says, "Okay, um, I'm going to go in the private storage." You know, so it's basically accessing the private storage and it takes the internal token and returns that back, right? So. It basically took this, this outer, outer scoped and inner scoped token. They have these different um, uses, different times of the different policies. And it said, okay, I'm gonna take this, go to the secret management tool, strip out the outer one, and get the inner one back from storage. Now, the container can use this token and say, get me database credentials. Um, and get you know a dynamically set, generated set of user password expiration um, that expire at a known time. You know, and the secret management tool can be responsible for revoking that after 24 hours. Um, it can go there and say, give me S3 credits, and do the same thing, generate S3 credentials, and then revoke that after 24 hours. It can go and say, give me a TLS server, 
right? This is, this is why secure introduction is important. Because if you can establish that first secret, if you can cover that first secret and keep it secure all the way through a chain of trust, then you can do as many operations as you want that you have authorization to perform. But you already have this, this mechanism. You have an authentication token, and presumably you have TLS, right, between your, your container and secret management tool. And all you have to do then is just make it a nice and get everything else. <coughs> Um, so a bit TLS cert, so you have a certificate, a private key, and issue a So this is why you really need, you know, you only really need to protect one secret, but because that's the key we came in, that's what you really need to protect. And so having a good secure introduction mechanism is really important. And that's one of the reasons I said, you know, if you take away nothing else from this talk, it's look at secret management systems because they are specialized to provide secure introduction. That is part of their core competency. At least some good ones. <laughs> um, Okay, so how do we do it? This is our checklist from before. And I said it was our, our success criteria. So don't let them live forever. The outer token expires. So when you've used that, that token once to look up the inner token, the wrap token, the only copy of that ID is gone. So the, the container has to store the memory. It no longer exists in any, anywhere else, right? And presumably inside the secret management system, or tool when it was almost all of them use encrypted backend storage. So when it was in in the store the storage for the outer wrapping token, it was encrypted. So that was also critical. Um, I should have mentioned that before I did, but that's pretty much a, a basic part of secret management tools. Distribute them securely. So the, the the real authentication token, this inner token, has the policies required to access, let's say, the database or access S3 credentials. That was covered the entire way. From the moment it was generated by the secret management tool all the way through the chain of trust, it was covered. There was no way, no point in time in which that was uh, in plain text. In the Limited exposure is disclosed. So by, by having a secret management tool generate the rest of these credentials, then it can look at the, the um, policies attached to a in particular authentication token and only grant those policies, and only grant specific, or only grant the specific <laughs> sequence. Um, break loss procedure. Yeah, we can lock down ethics, we can revoke that token. We can go through the audit logs so we know what was done with that token, what was generated, and what could they have access. So we have a really good break loss. And detect unauthorized access. So remember, going back here, so this is just going back to this picture, the outer token and the inner token. So we can actually detect unauthorized access in a really nice way um, because of the time and the use limit on this wrapper token. So when the application reads this, this inner token, when it goes to the, to the SM tool and says, please unwrap it, then if no inner token is found for some reason, there's an error, log it, and probably fail the job because you don't have secrets. However, if it gets back that it's been denied, that let's say that the token has been revoked, or that it's invalid, right? Then you can raise a high priority security because there's only two times this can happen. One is someone actually used the token. Someone took that token along the way, along the chain of trust, and used it. Um, and then as soon as they used it, it was revoked. And so when you try to use it, it doesn't work. So you know that someone has, has actually accessed that, and you can implement your, your break class procedures and start doing forensics. Um, and the other, you know, the other possible uh, possibility is that uh, there's a timing issue. 30 seconds wasn't long enough to start, right? So you can go in the audit logs and see, was that token ever used, right? So when you return that outer wrapping token, you say, here's, uh, let's say, a SHA sum of the token ID. And Go through the audit logs and say, hey, was this actually ever used? This token, right? You can correlate. It. So having good audit logs is, is very important. So, you know, so having those primitives that I that I mentioned before, which are very common primitives in terms of like security, you'll see bits and pieces of them all over the place. But if you combine those primitives in a tool, then you actually have a really, really good security detection story. Um, and once you have a good security detection story, then secret management is basically done. It's over. Right? You, you can manage it uh, very easily. Um, and this mechanism is not container specific. So you know, it can drop the, a wrapper, uh, a wrapping or outer token on an EC2 instance uh, via configuration management, soft, hot and shut. Um, you can inject a file containing this into a shrew and you just start starting out with shrews, right? Uh, there are lots of ways you can do this. Um, and there are other paradigms. And often, you know, you may find that you can't do something like this. You can't combine all of these different mechanisms together to have this really good chain of trust and really good story. Um, but, you know, security is about risk management. 
that was what I led with, and I, I, I still mean it. It's about risk management. And your organization needs to figure out where along the way can it afford to um, to have more risk. You know, what are the ingress points? Where you know who do, who do you trust within your organization? What level of trust do you have in your operators? Do you have legal recourse against them if something gets out? Right. You know, there are various ways that you can mitigate risk that are not just purely technical. And so, um, manage your risk. And depending <laughs> on your tech stack, you, know, you might be concerned. So you have to figure out the policy for your organization. Um, and there's really no magic bullet one tree answer to managing secrets in containers and models. So establish your success criteria and never forget it. Um, so plan your risk tolerance, security policy, success criteria, and demands. Don't delay. Do it now. Um, you'll never get back to it. Um, figure, out, figure it out and formalize it also. Use the secret management tool. These provide the primitives you need to do uh, successful secret management in containers and elsewhere. Um, you are all very smart, but it's a hard problem. Um, schedulers for containers provide really good integration points because almost everybody doing containers at scale is using a scheduler. So you can build in a hook, and even if you're using multiple schedulers, you can build in hooks that use the same API of the secret management tool which is really nice, you can keep that agnostic, but then just have the loop code to then put that into your job, then to your um, So I think we have minimal time. I think we probably have a couple minutes because we, we start late, but um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, in the unwrapping phase, yep. where your container is reaching out, I'm guessing decrypting, with the inner token, decrypting the username and password for a database, and then it, you mentioned it had a 24 hour expiry. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, yeah, that's it. That you just buy it. Oh, so not this. You're talking no, about no, no, no. It, 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 not like uh, here. That's it. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. So, so, so this is this is just saying that you know if you have this, if the container has a token, like once once you perform this kind of like switch, right? Once you've unwrapped using this paradigm, then once a container has a token, then it has an attached policy, access control policy, you know, authorization, and it has a TTL, it has a use count. And it can exchange that. It can go to the secret management tool and say, here's my identifying token that I, I'm storing in RAM, which is in my circle of trust. And please give me back these other things that are left. For a database specifically, though, is the secret management tool rotating the username and password that's actually being used in the background? Yeah, so, so that depends on the secret management tool. Okay. So some, some support, sometimes you'll just write those in, right? Okay. And maybe you know, you'll just write new ones every now and again, yeah. and you'll tell your your containers, maybe maybe the secret management tool can attach like a time to live that says, hey, you should check for a new one after this period of time. Some secret management tools can actually dynamically generate those, like Vault can do that, for instance. It can automatically generate and then later revoke and delete those credentials on the fly. Uh, maybe one quick other question? Yeah, real quick. Um, I was just going to say also some, like for example, some databases can actually use external authentication plugins. Yes, in which case the database is going to actually be using super management tools for authentication. Yep, yep. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. Um, pleasure being here.